This is um, January 26, 2011. I'm Michael Nolan. I'm interviewing. What is your name? Ben Benson. Okay. When and where were you born? When I was born in 1932, let's see, June 8th, and it would be in uh, New York City. Okay. Um, what education did you have before the war? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, before the war, uh, I used that high school. I did not. I went to college and uh, got my master's after, after uh, my, my service. Okay. Um, did you have a job before the war? No. I, 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 I qualified it. Yes, I did. Um, we were, the group of people like myself were known as jail bait, meaning uh, we were draft bait in the sense that we were like prisoners waiting to go, <laughs> go to war. That's why I use the word, word jail bait. But, Meaning that no one, major company wanted to hire you because they knew in a year or two you'd be drafted and that kind of train you, a training program through the company. So as a result, uh, a friend of mine and I, we got a job like a body shop, an auto body shop, and I worked in a gas station uh, for a couple of years, or a year and a half until I got drafted. Um, did you enlist or were you drafted? I was drafted. Um, when did you enter? Uh, good question. It would be in, uh, I think it was, it was March 1952, and I served for two years in 54. And what was your branch of service? I was in the, uh, the U.S. Army 7th Infantry, 7th Infantry Division. Um, where did you receive basic training? Uh, Fort Lee, Virginia. What, were there any, like, experience you want to share? Like, anything? happened or what was the training like? Well, training and basic training, uh, you've heard of the terminology basic training. It's exactly what it is. You're taken from a rural recruit and you meet people who are fellow recruits like yourself from all over the country and it's it's rather, it's like going to a cold shower because you're not prepared for this. And uh, it, it's a toughening up process, I would say. Um, what were your Dates of service. I'm sorry? What were your dates of service? 1952 and 54. Um, what was your specific training? My specific training was, and I didn't volunteer for this, it was uh, grave registration service. Now, what that means, in a nutshell, where <coughs> you were trained, uh, for instance, when we, after I finished basic training, and how I got into this branch, I don't know. <laughs> but. Uh, most of the, the fellow students were, the, their dads or their family were, had like funeral, funeral directors or mortuaries or that stuff. And the training we had, we, we had to learn every human bone in the body, and we actually went to hospitals, in hospital morgues, and viewed remains. Oh, okay. That sounds rather ghastly. And, it was, and I have to be honest with you, I, I wasn't geared to that type of situation. I had a weak stomach, so, so to speak. But that, that cleared all the real quickly. You had no choice. Um, what was your unit's assignment? Sir? What was your unit's assignment? My, my unit's assignment? My assignment? Yeah. I mean, when I got overseas or? Um, yeah. When I got overseas, I, uh, I was with the, this was during the wartime, uh, the 7th Entry Infantry Division. Uh, which was Army, and I should have brought a patch with me, but that was an hourglass insignia patch, shaped like an hourglass, black against a red background. And uh, so I was assigned, I don't know if you've heard in your history books, the 38th parallel in Korea. Well, your, your teacher may have heard of it. Uh, we, our, our facility, or our station was approximately a mile from the front line. Close to, yeah. yeah, I mean, and we were, we were in what we call a war theater, per se, because that was the general area of, 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 the, uh, of the fighting. Um, what battles were you in, or did you help? No, I wasn't in any battles, <laughs> thank goodness. Um, but our job, mainly, and I will not, certainly I'm open to questions, but uh, I'll try to make it as pleasant as possible. Um, our job uh, was to, when 
soldiers were killed, our job was to identify them and process them, process them, meaning identification if possible. Uh, and then they were shipped to a, uh, to a MASH unit, which was a hospital unit, uh, south of us. So our initial job uh, was to identify these soldiers that were, were killed in action, okay? And if necessary, to go to the front line and retrieve them if, they, if, if that were the case. Um, did you receive any medals? Um, yeah, I, I got a few, but uh, don't ask me. I, I think I, I've given them all to my grandchildren. I think there's eight of them. Oh. Um, how did you feel about combat then? I think it's a fair question. Uh, I wouldn't say I was a coward, but I wasn't exactly volunteer or chomping at the bit uh, on it. I'll, I'll answer by saying this, that uh, after a while you become immune to it, meaning you're scared. I mean, to say you weren't, I'd be lying. But after a while you don't think about that because you have a job to do or, or, or your day is so, we never knew what, how long a day or short it was going to be because it was a constant on, on the go. Um, but I, I can, you ever see a John Wayne, a John Wayne movie? You, you ever heard John? Yeah, I'm really dating myself. He well, has I, heard of John Wayne because his teachers talked about John Wayne. <laughs> well, anyway, John Wayne is, is, is a movie character, of course. And if, if he always put, when he, in his army pictures, propaganda, of course, he had bandoliers of <clears throat> bullets on his chest and pearl handle 45. So I was in, in this position. I think it was about two weeks, week and a half, not even that. And I went to the company commander who was a Lieutenant Colonel West Point graduate. It didn't look like it was. He needed a shave and a helmet. And I said, I want out. I can't take this duty anymore. And he told me, in pol not polite terms, what I can do with my duty. And he used to say, uh, I went back onto duty. Right? I did not get out. But after a while, uh, you became very respected we doing what we had to do. Somebody had to do it. You have to look at that point of view. How did you keep in touch with your family and friends? Uh, th those days we did not have CDs or uh, we, we wrote back and forth letters. And uh, I would tell you, a mail call was one of the most important parts of the day, meaning that's what you look forward to, was from a girlfriend or your parents or, or friends or whatever. So that's how you kept in communication. What were the food and supplies like? What, was it? what were the food and supplies like? Well, uh, believe it or not, in, in, in basic training and sometimes when you're on line duty, in other words, when you couldn't get back to a mess hall, you had what we call sea rations, which were canned goods or canned biscuits, which were, I, I thought, were from World War One. But most of the time, we had we, they had a, a mess hall, which the food was fresh food, considering it wasn't gourmet, but it, it was pretty good. Um, how about the supplies, like, that you, what supplies would you get every day? Supplies? Supplies, like weapons? Um, well, you, 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 you were always issued a standard <coughs> weapon. Uh, in my case, it was an M1 rifle, and then it was, after that was an M30, plus I had a, what we call a sidearm, which was a 45. I really didn't need it, per se, but uh, that, that was it. But you, once you were issued that, unless you it malfunctioned. There was no reason why you change it. You kept that indefinitely. A number was assigned, serial number, and you were responsible for cleaning that weapon and keeping it in good shape. Um, what was your most memorable experience? Uh, my most memorable experience was after the war. I was assigned. I was assigned to the. You've heard of the United Nations. Yeah. Uh -oh. I was assigned to the United Nations group. And what our job was, we called SNR, Search and Recovery. And our job was to search for those soldiers that were killed some, could be days, months, and were, were never found. It would be like caves or riverbeds. And I was assigned to the United Nations with uh, Turkish, uh, British, and French. And uh, it was a very good group. Uh, it, was, uh, it wasn't fun, but uh, it was enjoyable in the sense we were up we all in it together, and we we met new people. And this is uh, my first experience to uh, other other people from other nations on a direct basis. Um, how do you feel about your military experiences? How do I feel?
about your military experiences? Well, let me give you an answer that is universal. That it goes back to World War One, and I didn't invent it. I wish I did. <clears throat> I wouldn't buy it for a penny. And I wouldn't sell it for a million. The experience it matures you real fast. Okay. Uh, some people, as you've heard, uh, no matter what war theater they were in, or I'd say <clears throat> that it could be a Vietnam, it could have been a Korea, it could have been World War Two, World War One. They, they're traumatized, in other words, they refer to the word shell shock, meaning a mental aberration or a mental situation, they never get over it. For instance, they're afraid to uh, communicate, or if they do, they don't communicate well. Um, I didn't, fortunately, most of the people I was involved in didn't get that kind of experience. Um, is there anything else people should know about your experiences in Korea? Uh, no, I, 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 other than to say there was many like us, and I don't think I, I did more than or less than anybody else that was there at the time. Um, what did you do when you arrived home? I'm, I'm, I have a hearing problem. Could you speak a little? What did you do when you arrived home? When I arrived home? Uh, the first thing I did, I, I guess, was had an ice cream sundae. I did. <laughs> because you got to remember, when you, I was there almost two years. I think it was 19 months to be exact. I, I couldn't remember what it was to get an ice cream soda or an apple pie. Let me give you an example, uh, if I may digress. After the war, we went to the, the capital, which was of Korea, happens to be Seoul, S E O U L. It was all bombed out. Now it's rebuilt. Anyway, I was with a friend of mine, and <clears throat> there was a farmer selling apples by the roadside. And I hadn't seen an apple in a year and a half. I said, ah. So my friend said, like, don't buy it. Don't take it. I, he said, I said, why? He said, you don't know what's been contaminated or what? Well, I have an apple. But I took it back to base, and I scrubbed that thing. I washed it right? and ate it. And I had the worst case of dysentery for about three days. Because uh, they didn't wash things. Their sanitary condition, you and I look at it today, would be appalling. But that was their lifestyle. Did you get an education after the war? Yeah. And let me tell you, I think it's a good question, and I want to answer it directly. When I was in basic training, there was a group of uh, maybe only four or five college graduates in our, in our barracks. And they stood out, meaning there was something about, not because they were taller or, or bigger than we were, they weren't, or they didn't dress any better than we did, because we were all dressed the same in fatigue, but there was something about them. And I got talking to him, and I just got keyed in somehow. And being in the in the service, we have what we call the GI Bill, which paid for more than half of my college, and the other half I had to work. I did work my way through, but that was uh, that was certainly worthwhile, and that got me going on. So I went to college after I came out back from the service. Um, what college did you go to? I went to a college, a small liberal arts college called uh, Westminster. It's in the, uh, Pennsylvania between Pittsburgh and uh, uh, Youngstown, Ohio, right on the Pittsburgh, Ohio border. And I've taken some masters up in Columbia University. What was your job after the war? Well, after what? Well, I had several jobs, like most. I went to college first, and then I'm finding myself. So you're not the only one that's got to find myself. <laughs> uh, but I ended up, I would say, career wise, in purchasing. The last company I worked for 20 years was a Swiss company. I was their director of purchases, which was interesting because I went to Europe a few times and I traveled all over the United States. Um, do you belong to any veteran organization? No, no. I do not. <laughs> and, and I didn't want to be abrupt about that, but uh, and I guess they're fine organizations, but I'm the type of person I did my, my stick, so to speak, and I, that was fine, but I, want to, I don't want to keep reliving it. So I, I don't join. I'm not saying that it's a bad thing. It may be a good thing. It's not for me. How did your military experience affect your life? Well, I, I, I think it affected it in a sense that it got me more organized. And it matured me real fast. Uh, uh, I looked at things a little uh, differently, I would hope. So I, I th as I said before, that it, it's an experience that I wouldn't want to volunteer for. Well, uh, 
But having said that and having gone through it, I think the experience is good only because it, it makes you regimentation, it makes you learn how to live with other people in all kinds of conditions. So it does prepare you for, for, for life, for instance. And I, I will tell you, I found being a Boy Scout was the greatest thing going this way. Let me give you a In basic training, I was, we, were, we were assigned what we call a two-man pup tent. The pup tent's a little tent where you have to put up. Well, <clears throat> we got a course how to, how to erect a pup tent in about five seconds from this drill sergeant. Make a long story short, I was teamed up with a guy from Tennessee. I, I made a hillbilly, right? So uh, he says, well, I know how to put it. I said, fine. Well, it was falling all over the place. And I said, do me a favor. Just get out of the way. Let me do it. From my scouting experience, I learned how to put an erected tent and dig it like an irrigation, irrigation ditch around it. And it poured all night. And we were probably the only two guys who would dry it the next day. <laughs> so the scouting, boy, being a Boy Scout, uh, was a great experience. I mean, it helped me out quite a bit. Um, is there anything else? Um, No, um, well, he's done. Do you have any questions that you wanted to ask that he said, like things that you wanted to expand mm. on? Um, did you ever, um, and were you ever like discharged, and well, not discharged, um, registered, as in, um, how, how what's the term? Well, you, after your, your term of service, I was fine. Oh yeah, on reserve. Were you on reserve? On, on reserve. No, I was asked to go. Uh, Keep in mind, what, at that point, after you haven't seen the United States in 19 months, and you live in all these countries, you just want out. I, I mean, I wanted out of the service. But at that point, uh, they asked if it, to induce you or to, uh, to make you, they want, first of all, it wasn't reserved. They wanted you to hook up for another two or three or four years. I said, absolutely not. Yeah, but we'll pay you a bonus. I think it was 2000 in those days. You're talking over 50 years ago. That was a lot of money. Still a lot of money. And they said, well, if you don't take that, how about we'll, we'll send you to officer's training school and you can make this and do that? And I said, no, I want out. And I did. So I, and I didn't, have, going through that routine, uh, did I, some people, friends of mine went to reserves, I did not. And I'm not sorry, I didn't. There's nothing wrong with being reserves, but not for me. Yeah. Well, you served, you served your time and you did a great job. and. Big button. You served your time and you did a great job, and that's well, what is yeah, you know uh, important. I mean, it is, and, but uh, uh, of course, from the army's point of view, or the armed services, they want to keep you in as long as they can, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you're fresh meat as far as they're concerned, I mean, they, and they get bonus points if they can get you to re up or re list, mm -hmm. whatever. Uh, but I think the majority of us uh, going through that experience just wanted out. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, you saw a very tough part of this. Um, well, yeah, it was, it was going pleasant. up very fast. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. It was too fast. I mean, uh, so it, listening to what you said, reading what you wrote, you were, I mean, basically a mortician then, right? More. A mortician? Would that be a mortician? Um, uh, well, funeral? It, 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 not, I mean, not in a complete sense, because okay. a mortician, as I understood, we had to study that too would prepare the remains and so forth. We did not. So for you instance, identified. Above, we, our primary was identified, and we may, like formaldehyde, we use formaldehyde, mm -hmm. which is a preservative. Uh, and um, what we did, for instance, on finger, for fingerprints, we, we always shot formaldehyde to make sure the fingerprints, were, as best we could, were preserved. Okay. And, uh, so if they didn't have their dog tags on, like if their dog tags came off or whatever, how would well, you go about we, identifying them? Well, we, we, we would take, my job, our, our station's job, was was the first thing you took prints, if there were prints available, in some cases there weren't, mm -hmm. but there were, and let's say in that case there were, every every enlisted man or draftee or armed service personnel has a, has a record, what they call DOD, uh, which is duplicated, it's, it's a, the Veterans Administration has it. Uh, even to this day, if you had a grandfather, you said, yeah, I want to trace him, but I, uh, I have his name, but I don't have any, that's all I have, I don't have his rank. Most likely, they could, if you give him the years he served, they could trade. Same with fingerprints. When you first come into service, you're fingerprinted. Okay. Right? 
and those are, are, are part of a, are, you're part of a what they call a record jacket. So, <clears throat> if this person or persons come in that they, they, you couldn't identify them through, couldn't I, or uh, a tag or whatever, you you <clears throat> when you when I wrote a report with my staff, uh, my sergeant at the time, and I, I eventually replaced him. Your job was to say where was he found, where was he, what, what we we had to be had to take a map course. What grid coordinate? Where was he found? What unit was he attached to? So you could backtrack and say, well, he was attached to the signal corps. Mm -hmm. he, he was a, infantry, or he's on a special assignment. So detective work. Is yeah. Kind of, you know? If you look at it that way, and I will tell you, not to be gruesome, one of the I, I was maybe a couple months before I was going to get home. Uh, it was two o'clock in the morning, and this <clears throat> lieutenant woke me up, and I was sound asleep. He, and he said, come with me. And, I, and he said, we're going to, to the autopsy tent. I said, what for? I, I said, you don't need me for that. That's, that's my job. And make a long story short, the, the fellow that, uh, that was, or the person that was supposed to uh, identify the remains and, and, and take the, uh, you had the surgeon who was giving dictation. But you always had a backup, what they call a scribe, in case the machine went off, you always have a record. Mm -hmm. So that particular person wasn't available. So I was drafted literally to, to, to witness, I never witnessed an autopsy in my life. And I felt, oh my God, this is going to be awful. Yeah. <laughs> because I won't, go either, I won't tell you what the procedure was, other than when this doctor, was a young doctor, and spoke very slowly, and he was always very patient. He said, did you hear what I said? So. He said, since this is your first time, let me explain what we're doing. He said, this particular person came in, and uh, uh, we believe it's a suicide. It was recorded as suicide, but we, don't, we can't accept that. We've got to do an auto immediate autopsy to verify. Well, it turned out, I mean, you really get centralized. This the soldier was killed. His father was a congressman, a U.S. congressman. And when he heard that, he said, my son never commits. My son was killed in battle. Forget the war was over, all right? Mm -hmm. Or it was an accident. It was certainly not. And he flew, his congressman flew over. I didn't know that. He, <clears throat> he was in a tent. I didn't know that. Wow. I mean, they told me that. So this doctor, in, when he made the, the <clears throat> doing the autopsy process, he said, I want you to show you the, the slant of this bullet. He took a string. He said, what a, I said, what are you doing? And, he said, I want you to look at that. After a while, I could, and uh, uh, you know, keep in mind, I had now a year and a half experience of this, so mm -hmm. it didn't bother me. He said, the angle of that bullet, it was a 45, could not have been self-inflicted. I don't know how it came up, but he did. And it wasn't. Oh. I, I mean, excuse me, it was self-inflicted. In other words, okay. he had committed suicide. Okay. And his father, who was <clears throat> naturally a bit upset, but his upsetment was, which I thought was very shallow, was more concerned. He didn't seem to know, care, want to know why, why did he commit suicide. Not my son. He couldn't have done that. If somebody had a shot him, or it was an accident, or whatever. So that was an interesting. That, that, is, that is very interesting. Yeah. Um, I mean, the whole process, and you, there was a, a part that you wrote about too that you accompanied um, the remains home. Yeah, I did. And I was offered the. Uh, the if, if, to re-up that that would be my duty, and I said, no, I don't want to do that. I didn't. I, I keep, keep in mind that it was just that I wanted out. Yeah. I wanted to back, go back to civilian right. life, right. and I didn't want any more part of it. Well, I think the accompanying the remains home could be very draining. It could somebody. be, but it's, it's a wonderful thing if, if, you can, if you can assure the parents or, or, or the loved ones that uh, he was given the best, he or she, mm -hmm. or, I never did see a female in that regard, but that he was given the best possible, you know, situation and respect and so forth. But you're right; it takes a certain. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But I, I didn't want to do that. Right. Now, isn't that I want to do? I thought I could do it. I just. You were done. <laughs> I, I wanted out. You were done. Now yeah. you said that after you identified the bodies, they went to a mass unit. Yeah. Were you close to the mass unit then? Well, I would say we were. Maybe three miles, okay. five miles, okay. and then they were shipped from there to Japan, and then flown to the states. Okay, so when you probably watched the TV show Mash or the movie Mash, 
Was there any similarities? I mean, well, did they I, do I, a pretty good job? Yes and no. I, I think it'd be uh, they they try as much as they kid around. The actual work was, was very accurate. Okay. Yeah, I don't think they clown in the mesh. You didn't see that kind of clowning around. Right. Uh, a guy dressed in women's clothes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but uh, uh, there were procedures, and uh, uh, they went by the book pretty well. I think they went pretty well. No, that's, well. that's good. Yeah, that was uh, very well done, matter of fact. Um, now, how about your leave time? Like well, when you when had you, when you had when, leave. When, when you had leave time. In other words, when you were in, in combat service or at a certain time, you got what we call points, and you could go, you could apply to go. To, in our case, was uh, Japan, what they called R and R, rest and recovery. It was more like rest and drinking, but <laughs> but anyway, it was it was a neat thing because when you when you landed in Tokyo, base, you went to a mess hall, and the first time you got a steak dinner. Each person got a steak dinner, baked potatoes, and as much as you wanted. You could take three steaks if you wanted, so that was neat. And then you had a week, and you were on your own. You could do whatever you wanted. And it was, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. That was worth it. Yeah. So you got to see a lot of Japan then. Oh yeah. How nice. That's and I neat. went to Hong Kong once too, so it was it was good. Yeah. Well, that that's I, that I is a, a good experience to be able to see. We just got done talking about World War One, and oh. that's one of the things that I talked about in class was the fact that a lot of kids enlisted, young men, kids right. I call them, they were seventeen because it was an experience to go. They wouldn't normally get to see Europe and. Well, if they could do it without. Be, the threat of being killed mm, would have been mm -hmm. all right. Uh, but I, 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 on the other hand, I'll say this. It was, it was a good, you bring up a good point, because I think it was a good thing, because people like myself, uh, I could have never gone to college because my parents couldn't afford to send me. You know, just one of those things. So with the GI Bill, which paid half, uh, <clears throat> and people like myself, we worked the other half, and, and pay for it. We couldn't have done that without without this without the service. So that was very beneficial. Right, right. Now, one of the things I that I was thinking about too, you said you had to go out to the battlefield sometimes to retrieve the bodies. Right. Did you ever like? I take it the battlefield was still at that point, as opposed to fighting going yeah, on. Yeah, it, it was. Okay. Yes, it was. So that I you did, never had if to your worry. Question was, did we ever come under fire? Uh, yes and no. Uh, not on the battlefield, but our own section was. Or shell, but then we had uh, <coughs> uh, you dug holes or trenches. You, that was where you went during that. But that did only happen a couple of times. So okay. And what about being involved with the Korean culture at all? Korean culture uh, was a complete uh, different culture than ours. I, I I don't know if you with fellow students in, in this school. If you ever become an Oriental student. Uh, just to learn the language, you've got to be brilliant. I mean, <laughs> but at one time I could tell a North Korean, a South Korean, a Chinese, and Japanese and Korean, just because my job was, was always study facial and whatever. I couldn't do it. I probably could do it at the training. Uh, but the question was in culture. Uh, keep in mind, they were very South Korea was now it's a very rich country. It was, then you were going back. I'm trying to think, 57 years ago. And they were a very poor country. And uh, people your age, if they, went, they, if they were lucky, they got to school, right? And most of them went past the fifth grade. Uh, those that did wanted to go, of course, they wanted to go to the United States because they heard there was the land of milk and honey and golden mm -hmm. streets to them. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them did, and did very well. Uh, but it was a, it was a, it was a different type of person. Makeup wise, I mean, uh, their, their idea, and even, and I'm not trying to give you a lecture, although I do teach, is <laughs> even you'll see it in the Middle East, the value of life is not what you and I would put on. I mean, they're, they're continue, they're, they're, they want to contend to go on living. I don't mean that. They do. But if, if their neighbors are killed or a family is killed, that's a terrible thing. But, you know, they accept it. That's you know, it's rolling off a lot of it. That's the way it is. We, you and I would accept that. Mm -hmm. I mean, we'd have to, but in a different way. Mm -hmm. I brought some pictures I, I, I'd like to leave with your... Okay, great. Yeah, it's not many of them. You can make this part of the record. You can have them. Uh, I think I've them on the back. 
this was prior to the, right after we finished basic basic training. Which one of these are you? This is me. This is. No, uh, oh, you're not gonna. Come on, <laughs> Guys, it has to be today. It has to be 200 pounds. That's me on, uh, right here. And that's me on the left there. Now that's, that was right, that was front of the mortuary tent, actually. Now, after basic training, how did they assign you this position? I mean, how I, did know, that happen? Point. I will tell you, in basic training, we, we were finished. Say on Sunday morning, and those are one of the church, which we did. And we came back by 10 o'clock, and you were lined up in front of your, your barracks. And those were my friends. It was about 80 guys that were barracks. So all 80 of us were waiting in line. And they, this truck would come on, this guy would get rusted and says, Smith, Jones, you know, and any time they call your name, you had to go in this truck. You know, that was it. I was the only guy left standing. <laughs> The only guy. I said, "What's going?" On? And this, so I'm about to take off when S and this jeep comes run, comes up and stops in front of me. He says, "Your name Benson?" I said, "Yeah." He says, "Hop in." I said, "Corporal." I said, "Okay." I said, "Where are we going?" He said, "You're going to." I said, oh, "I don't know." Let's say, oh, "We're going to Great Registration." I said, "You got the wrong guy. You must be a mistake. It's not me." Is that your name? Because he didn't care. He, right. he wanted out of there, right? That's where I was left off. That's how I started. Wow. Well, the uh, the only thing I can think of, the, the, or why I was selected, was unfortunately I told somebody I could type. <laughs> <laughs> well, that little thing, because you had to type up all your reports. You had a little portable uh, uh, typewriter. So that might have been. But as I say, 99% were the, the, the fellows I ended up with, their families or relatives were involved somehow in mortuaries mm -hmm. or funeral directors or whatever. Okay. Well, I think it's a good thing that you were assigned that and not, you know, <laughs> something else. Well, you know, because it, you never know, I mean, well, you didn't have to see. I, I, I'm, I'm an artist uh, part-time, and, and, and believe it or not, uh, I study features a lot. Sometimes my wife will nudge me, mm. says, you're staring at that person. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, I guess it's a, it was good in a sense that, uh, it, as I said earlier, it matured you fast. But also, if you could pass the initial mm -hmm. shock, mm -hmm. and it took me a while. Because uh, I was the type of guy, if I cut my finger, I'd go, oh. <laughs> 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 But after a while, you get immune to that, right? And uh, uh, it, it teaches you a lesson which you, you'll come yourself, Not hopefully not that. But you say, I can never do that. But you can do it if you put your mind to it. And you, you, and you focus and you say, somebody's got to do it, and I'm it, and do it. Whether it's going to college and studying for an exam and think I'll never be able to do it, you can do it. Well, you would have to become desensitized to it. You do. It would Because you, otherwise you, you would literally crack right. up. Right. And you would have to it. just say, okay, that's that's just a shell. It's not who they were. And but a lot of people had a lot of worse jobs in you know, actual combat. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, that's why, you know, that's what I was thinking. I mean, you're here and you yeah. can tell these stories and... But then I, I was going to school one time, and I kicked myself, and so was my wife, because when I was in wrestling, I bought a Makimo pearl. You've heard of Makimo pearls? Mm, mm, Mickey Moto ones? They're uh -huh. like Tiffany. Uh -huh. I talked to the class about Mickey Moto pearls one time. I said well, they I were the best ones to get. I said to this girl, which I got a Dear John, <laughs> Dear John letter. Do you ever hear of Dear John? <laughs> dear John letter is a letter that GI people like myself would get. <laughs> dear Ben. Sorry to tell you, but I've gone, I've met another man or another guy, and we're going to get married or whatever. <laughs> and there you go with this girl. But I, I gave her this uh, string of, which I'm sorry I did today. Yeah. <laughs> she's well, a lucky I girl that she, she got those. It. That's that's a pretty nice gift. And this is a fellow that, now this is a, a, a Korean uh, boy. He was about 15, 16, I guess. He worked for us, all right? He, his job was to, uh, what we call a field runner. He would get, Bit different equipment we needed to bring up, and this and this is uh, this is a uh, <coughs> some buddies of mine. We're, that was about a mile from the line, in a fox where you dug a foxhole. You can have that. Now you mentioned when I was telling you about the gentleman we interviewed yesterday and in the cold in the Arctic. You said it was pretty darn cold over in Korea too. Yeah, 
it was. We had what we, it, everybody calls it the land of the midnight, you know, the, 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 not the midnight sun, but beautiful I thought it was a miserable country, really? <laughs> quite frankly. Okay. But uh, it was hot in the summer and frigid cold, I mean, really cold. So very extremes. Yeah. You can have that picture for your file. Um, I noticed that there's African Americans in there. Were you mixed? Were you, were you mixed with African Americans? African Americans? Yeah. They're, they're, let me say this. I brought this along for you. I'd like you to have this since you're on an assignment. This is one I did at Truman some years ago. You can write this now. Truman, you brought up a good question. Truman uh, was the was the president that desegregated the armed forces through what we call an executive order, meaning he could write an order and he has to go through Congress or anything else. That was it. All armed services from that point on, I think it was in 1950, uh, in other words, how to, how to treat Afro-Americans or Oriental or whatever equally, on an equal basis. Okay, There was no more segregation. So. That's a beautiful picture. Well, I've been doing. I've been collecting uh, over 40 years. I've um, I've done all the presidents from up to from uh, Washington to Obama. Nice. So it's a lot of fun. That is a neat thing. What I want to mention, if you're interested, I I, I teach a course up in SUNY on the presidents, mm -hmm. and I've also gone to high schools and elementary schools. If you're interested, you know, uh, I what I do is I talk about presidents and I bring original, I have original documents, letters. And, Appointments, whatever, signed by these. Oh, people. neat. So if, it, if that ever comes up in your history class, I'd be more happy to do that. Okay. Uh, well, that's, that's wonderful to you know. You can have that. It gives you a little note. You may want to read that. A lot of people don't realize how many people, how many people do you think were killed in Korea? Americans. Just Americans. Um, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I'm not sure. Take a guess. Hundred. How many? Hundred thousand. No, 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 but believe it or not. You're not that, you're, you're wrong, but you're not that terribly wrong. I ask the question, people a lot older than you, and their question is, oh, oh, let's see, maybe a thousand? No, I'll change it, maybe 1,200. You read my note. Well, you can have that. You can put that in the envelope if you want. Now, looking at that, and thinking about what I teach, I think to me the saddest thing about Korea is that nothing changed. You know, it, it, nothing changed. Well, 38 the parallel Korea, state, Korea has changed parallel. dramatically. Oh, country. it has, yeah, it has changed now, but I think the fact that, you know, we lost 51,000 men. Yeah. Um, they lost people, and it didn't, you know, all it did well, was make the demilitarized zone the, for, more formal. But, but do you ever hear the terminology? The Forgotten War. Mm, mm -hmm. Korea, and not that I, because I, I don't, I have a brother, an older brother, who's also in Korea. Uh, who, when you mentioned earlier, do I belong to the Veterans Association? He talks Korea constantly, you know, and, and, and to the point where it's just irritating to me, but that's not the <laughs> But uh, it, 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 it's, a, it's a country uh, that as I say, has developed quite a bit since in, since I was there. But when I came home, it wasn't like World War II or Vietnam. Well, gee, hey, hey, mm -hmm. you were just, you know, a typical example was somebody coming, gee, I haven't seen you in a while. This is a high school friend of mine. Where you been? I haven't seen you in a while. So people just didn't pay attention? And that was true. Um, he had gone on to college right away. You know, and, uh, so. Well, and it is, now that you say something like that, you think about all the fanfare World War II vets got, you know, I mean, you, you, the, you know, that infamous picture of the sailor kissing the oh, girl yeah. in Times Square, and, you know, I mean, it's over, and everybody was thrilled, and, sure. and then you had the other extreme with Vietnam, which I can remember being a young girl, and did those... You, did you, your dad was it? Was my dad was between Korea and Vietnam. Have but, you ever had the experience of going to any situation where there multiple <coughs> veterans of multiple wars. The Vietnam soldier stands out, mm -hmm. and I'll tell you why, and that in a positive sense to me. I go to the VA <coughs> over in Rome, uh, once a year for a physical, 
and if, it may not be unfair, but they're scuzzy looking. It's the type of guy that I wouldn't want my wife to see walking down the street in a dark, in a dark area, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. protected. Uh, they have tattoos all over. There, there was it may be unfair to the unfair criticism, but they were very high on drugs. Remember? Well, right. I mean, that was a real problem. But even today, they 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 they, they, they just look. I don't know. Well, and I and I guess what I was thinking about is they had there was such disrespect for them when they came home. I mean, I think they were. You know, I can remember watching the television. You know, and back and that was back when. There was one TV in the house that was black and white. We had three channels, and they it was the news. And they were coming back, and people were throwing things at them and yelling at them, and you know, saying things like you know the baby killer and and all of that. And yeah, um, my cousin who was in Vietnam still will not talk about it to really? this day. Most of them don't. And I think a lot of them don't. Do you remember it was that Agent Orange? Yeah, well, my dad worked for Dow Chemical, which manufactured Agent Orange. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was, all of this was really, I think Vietnam is that, you know, those, there's nerves, that it's, it still touches that. And so Korea, I can see what you just said, totally forgotten in there. Now, have you interviewed veterans of World War II? Yes, we have. Yeah, that's we don't a have dying it. breed, per it se, is. because they're, Literal, they're, they're I mean, in the late 80s, aren't they now? Yes, and we don't have any this year. Um, no, last, I, and maybe in a couple of years you won't have any, period. Exactly. Awesome. So, well, I, but I was just saying, your name is Michael. Yeah. That, and, and I say, I want to say this objectively. Forget it, it's me saying. I think not only your school for this project, and I said this when we first met with Michael, that it is so important that if you can bring history into the classroom, mm. what do I mean by that? But I'm saying. I don't know about you, and I'm not saying in front of your teacher, but sometimes reading, you know, a boring book. On, um, when I was your age, I had to learn all the Battle of Ruskiny and, you know, all, the, all these dates. And to this day, I don't know what they did for me, <laughs> dates, but that's another thing. But if you can bring somebody, not me or somebody else, or, or let's say somebody that has a Civil War collection that can bring in letters from the Civil War that had written during the war battle, that brings history alive rather than reading about it. And, and I, let me w conclude by saying this. I, as I tell you, I teach a course at Masuni on the presidents. And I fill in uh, once in a while for uh, this professor when he takes a sabbatical. And, uh, and the average age of, of those student, the college students are from 18 to 22. Okay? And I'll ask them, okay, and after I've given them a course, we, we talked about president, from George Washington to Obama. Now keep in mind, we have George Washington. Abraham Lincoln, Theodore Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, Truman. These are just names to you, okay? But they're pretty, pretty high up there in his reputation. Uh, the question I'll ask him, I said, now, we've studied the president. Tell me, who was, the, 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 in your mind, the best president we ever had? And tell me who the worst, the, who's the worst president? Ninety percent. You know what the answer is? You're going to tell me. Go ahead. Okay, would you? That's good. You say this is the best, right? Well, okay, the no, best that, is George that's Washington. That's a very because he's certainly he's certainly upgraded up there. And who's the worst in your mind? And that's probably unfair because if I say Warren Hardy, you're gonna say Warren who? <laughs> we don't know who. It is. Who do you think is the worst? I don't know. I've only been around for three presidents. Um, <sighs> now, I'm not putting you on the spot. Let me, let me make it easy for you. Ninety percent of the answers were. <coughs> The best president was Ronald Reagan. The worst president was George W. Bush. Really? And I went to back to this professor. Like, I said, there's something wrong with this, edu this educational setup. He said, what do you mean? And I said, they're talking in a contemporary mode, meaning what mm -hmm. they, because mm -hmm. they, they remember Reagan, and they certainly mm -hmm. remember G.W. Bush. You were around for that. But they certainly weren't around for Franklin Roosevelt or, or Teddy Roosevelt or Truman. They, they, that's just names in the book. But even seven said that. Where is history? Where is the teaching involved when they can tell you Ronald Reagan was the best president we ever had? He was a tremendous communicator, right? George W. Bush, I criticize why, why he went into the war he did, but it takes a minimum of 10 years to determine good, bad, or indifferent because papers come out, people die, they leave, 
the remarks recorded. And uh, so this this was an interesting insight for me when I'm teaching. Well, it's been a lot of fun for me. Is there any other questions you may have? Um, no, that's... that's sure. It, yeah. Okay. Well, it's been a lot of fun for me. Oh. Yeah, me too. I hope it has been for you. Oh, wonderful. It was great. So now...